Joining me now to discuss whether a two-state solution is still viable is Sadi Makdesi in Los Angeles. He's the author of Palestine Inside Out, an Everyday Occupation. Also joining us here in Washington is Khalil Jashan, a Middle East analyst and lecturer at Pepperdine University. Welcome to you both. Let me begin with these comments by Saeed Barakat that we just heard there. He says, a moment of truth for the Palestinian leadership has come. Has the Palestinian leadership then known all along that a two-state solution simply wasn't viable? And if so, why is it, why is it talking about a one-state solution only now? Let's go to Khalil Jashan first. Well, the, the, the moment of truth has arrived long time ago. Unfortunately, though, uh, the Palestinian uh, leadership, uh, particularly the PA, has been so kind of engrossed, if you will, in, in the peace process or so-called peace process to the point where it hasn't been able to really distinguish, uh, you know, the trees from the forest uh, or the forest from the trees, for that matter. Uh, and therefore, uh, they continue to kind of uh, proceed with this uh, uh, pitfall, you know, process uh, uh, without noticing that the objective is no longer achievable. Uh, Sari Magdasi, should the Palestinian leadership have known a long time ago and told the Palestinian people that a two-state solution simply wasn't viable given the facts on the ground that are being built, the colonization of land, but also the acquisition of water resources in the West Bank by Israel? Yeah, they should have said it a long time ago, and I think, in fact, they should never have really pursued the two-state solution for as long as they have been trying to do so. I think Khalil is right that they've been kind of obsessed with the narrative that they didn't really, either they didn't fully understand or they didn't, or they didn't really see where it was going. I think the important thing now is to refocus and to see what solution can serve, can best serve the needs of all of the components of the Palestinian people, and that means those living under occupation, those refugees and those in exile, and also those living as second-class citizens of the state of Israel. And the two-state solution, no matter how formulated, never addressed all of those components of the people. Only the one-state solution does. I think that's why the time really is now to refocus everybody's energies on that, on that outcome. Khalil Jashan, how seriously, though, should we take Arakat's comments? Uh, is he echoing the position of the Palestinian leadership, a shifting position perhaps, or did he simply go out on a limb? Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, Saeb was a bit emotional, I think, in his statement and a bit alarmist, uh, considering the fact uh, that, you know, that he is the chief negotiator. Uh, for the Palestinians, and, and he continues to be part of the two-state solution in a way. Uh, but at the same time, that reflects the justified frustration on, on the part of the most committed element or, or sector of Palestinian society to this two-state solution, uh, to the fact that Israel is not cooperating with them, uh, and, and the United States keep uh, dancing around the issue and reneging on some earlier uh, commitments. So, yes, I think it must reflect the frustration uh, of the leadership. Now, whether they mean what they say or say what, the, what they mean, uh, I'm, I'm doubtful. I, I think should there be a resumption of, of a legitimate and, and, and credible peace process based on the two-state solution, I have a feeling they'll go back to the same old game. Sorry, Magdasi, uh, the same old game. You've always been a proponent of a one-state solution. How will it work, though? Will the Israeli right ever accept it? Will Israeli religious groups ever accept this concept? No, in fact, one of the advantages of the one-state solution is that the idea of trying to, to sort of supplicate the Israelis and the Americans to, to beg them to come around to see reason for a two-state solution is abandoned because we have to look to historical precedents. And the, South Africa is the mo single most obvious case. South Africa did not abandon apartheid simply because the, 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 white, the white government realized that it was the right thing to do. It abandoned apartheid because it was compelled to do so by nonviolent pressure from, out, from applied from the outside world. The same thing goes in this case. The idea that we're going to expect the Israelis to suddenly see the light is, has always been, I think, unrealistic. And the only realistic thing is to combine a demand for a one-state solution, which means justice and equality for all, with the, the, the rampant, I think, uh, boycott, divestment, sanctions uh, movement that's, that's growing around the world. That's the way to do it. It's, it's, to, it's to apply pressure, not to beg and to supplicate and to hope, and to have to pursue this negotiations between two grossly disproportionately unequal parties. Uh, Khalil Shashan, you had been a two-state supporter for a very long time before becoming disillusioned about the idea of this ever being a feasible or practical uh, result. Is it time then for the Palestinian leadership to consider resigning after all these years of failed diplomacy and failed negotiation that hasn't lived up to the mere minimum of Palestinian aspirations? I think I represent kind of like the typical mainstream of Palestinian society worldwide that viewed 
and grudgingly uh, over the years accepted the two-state solution as the most practical uh, kind of political, if you will, uh, uh, proposal to solve the Palestine question. However, it has become clear over the years since the early 90s that Israel is not willing to play that game and is not willing to accept uh, the exchange of land uh, for peace and have a credible Palestinian state emerge alongside uh, Israel. Yes, I think it's time. Uh, the issue is not resigning as much as uh, resigning the old position, if you will. Uh, because frankly, I mean, if the Palestinian leadership were to resign en masse right now, I mean, who's, who's going to take over? Uh, uh, the opposition, uh, Hamas, for example, is opposed to the one-state solution. So who's going to champion the one-state solution? There needs to be, I think, at one point, a change of leadership down the road uh, in Palestine, and there has to be a democratically elected leadership uh, that is willing to level with the Palestinian people on, on the terms of what is feasible and what's possible uh, in terms of the one-state solution. Sari Magdisi, is Hamas, though, uh, opposed to a one-state solution? They've always said that they would accept whatever solution would be ratified by the Palestinian people. Are we, are we in fact, seeing a fundamental dovetailing between the position of Hamas and the Palestinian Authority uh, on this issue of one state? No. I, no, I don't think so. I think that they have a very different agenda. And I think we're, if we want to look for leadership right now, we should look not to the to the uh, the governments either in Gaza or in Ramallah, but rather to the the civil society components of, of Palestinian the Palestinian people, both the ones under occupation, the ones inside Israel, and the ones overseas. I think the point about the the feasibility of this is that the two state solution was never feasible. If by feasible you mean addressing the rights of all the components of the Palestinian people, no no matter which version of the two state solution we're talking about, it never addressed the rights of the refugees, most importantly, who are the single biggest component of the Palestinian people, nor did it address in any way the rights of the Palestinians who live as second-class and third-class citizens inside the state of Israel. So the only way to, to, to feasibly address all of the different con constituents of the Palestinian people is, is one state. I think it is supremely achievable. It's, it's actually much more rational, if you think about it, than trying to divide up a very small piece of land into, into islands and cantons and, you know, supposedly ethnically pure areas. That's, that was always a delusional notion, I think. So I think the one state gives everybody something to focus on. It's very easy to understand. It's extremely easy to mobilize popular opinion around the world behind it because its principles are simple, justice, and equality. Everybody understands those notions. That's why it's much more, I think, feasible than trying to explain to people why some Palestinians might get their rights addressed, the ones under occupation, but not others, the ones in exile, the ones in Israel. So I think it's, it's uni unifying the cause is actually much clearer, much simpler. And I think really, I really do think that Sorry, civil society and all the institutions let show us the way. If only it were so simple. Thank you very much. Sari Magdasi and Khalil Jashan, thanks to both of you for joining us. Thank you.